Greetings and thanks for joining us. Welcome to our conversation on Russia invades Ukraine, a principled response. Our guest today is not really a guest. Uh, he's a member of the Carnegie Council family, Nick Gvozdev. Nick's joining us from his home in Newport, Rhode Island. Nice to see you, Nick. Hi, Joel. Thanks for being here. Now, many of you will recognize Nick as a Carnegie Council senior fellow and director of our U.S. Global Engagement Program. Nick's also a professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And he is also the editor of the journal Orbis, published by Foreign Policy Research Institute. Now, for all of you in attendance today, a reminder that you can submit questions for Nick and for me via the chat function. And we wanna make this as conversational and as lively as possible. So I'm gonna encourage you now to use the chat and to, uh, to join us with your questions or comments. So Nick, there's a lot of great journalism and political analysis happening in real time right now. I'm sure many people are probably multitasking and watching CNN or the news feed of their choice while they're watching us, right? So I, I want to use our time together to talk about something a little bit different to try to add some value to all this journalism and analysis to think about the principles that are at stake um, in this um, really important news event. So as our title suggests, we want to be thinking about a principled response to what we're all seeing in the news. So just to start the conversation, uh, the first principle that comes to mind for me is the principle of sovereignty. It's really the basis of the international system as we know it today. So Russia has invaded the sovereign country of Ukraine. So can you give us some context as to Russia's justification for violating this principle and you know how its arguments have been received? And I guess the bottom line question is, are they trying to rewrite the rule book in some way? Now, those are all good questions, Joel. And let me just start by saying that uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. Uh, and so in some ways, this is a continuation of a process that's been going on now for, for nearly eight years. And the justifications, I think, are important for us to, to look at in the sense that Russia uh, is attempting to justify what it did in 2014 and what it is doing today uh, with invocation to what would be in the Western tradition, the just war tradition. Uh, in the Orthodox world, there is what's known as the justifiable war tradition. Uh, we saw Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church a few days ago make reference to uh, the need to, to combat evil, as he put it. So the, the, the Russian government attempted to create a narrative that it needed to violate the sovereignty of Ukraine again uh, because genocide was taking place, because you had an illegitimate government taken over by extremists, and, and of course the, the Russians uh, and the Kremlin in particular cites this uh, theme of what they call denazification. Uh, of course, as we know uh, from all of the sources, none of this was happening. Uh, there is no genocide going on. Uh, people may not like actions of the Ukrainian government, but uh, it's a pretty much of a stretch to say that uh, uh, a president, a Ukrainian president who comes from a Jewish ancestry somehow is, is, is a member of the National Socialist Party. So in that sense, the, 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 uh, all of this effort to try to gin up uh, a responsibility to protect that if Russia didn't act now, there would be grave humanitarian crises, uh, doesn't hold water. But it is important that uh, the Kremlin attempted to create the narrative uh, to try to provide uh, what they would see as an ethical justification. Uh, there's also another consideration that you've raised, and this is connected to sovereignty, and that is, uh, and this is, is coming back to principles that we would derive from Hans Morgenthau, about does a country have a right to violate the sovereignty of another country if it believes that there is an imminent threat? So again, something that the Kremlin has set forward as a narrative is that Ukraine was moving closer to the uh, Western uh, countries, it was moving closer to NATO, the United States, that 
even if it didn't join NATO, uh, Ukraine would be hosting uh, Western military bases and missiles on Russia's borders, and this was an unacceptable threat uh, to Russia, and Russia had to act. Uh, in that sense, again, even though Ukraine has been talking with NATO, there's been training and equipping, again, no evidence that there was an imminent threat that required uh, a violation uh, of Ukrainian territory by, by military force. Uh, it would be like saying uh, the United States would decide to preempt the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 by invading Cuba in 1957. Um, if there had been a threat developing along these lines down the road, we might be having a different discussion. But to say in 2022 that Ukraine was taking steps which uh, were of existential danger to the Russian Federation and that Russia had to respond uh, again, this is a prima facie case that doesn't hold water. Having said that, that I would argue that uh, none of the ethical justifications for Russian action uh, exist. What about responses? And you did highlight a key thing, collective security. This is a principle of the international order that the attack on the sovereignty of one state uh, is a threat to every state. So even if you're not in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, everyone is a member of the United Nations. The United Nations takes as its cornerstone that preserving the territorial integrity and sovereignty of every state uh, is, the, is the starting point. So I think that responding to Russian actions is certainly ethical. The question I think we're going to be debate, we have been debating, we debated it prior, to the Russian invasion and that we're debating now is what are the principled responses? What are the ethical responses? We've established a duty to respond to assist Ukraine, but the debate is now, well, what are the ethical steps? What are the considerations, both with regard to Ukraine itself, but also uh, with regard to how does this affect the peace and stability of the world as a whole? That's great. No, thank you for that, Nick. So this leads to the next question about, it, it'll get to responses, but first I want to talk a little bit more about the nature of the conflict. And um, this is about self-determination. It's about the right of the Ukrainian people to have their democracy and their own process of self-determination. So NATO has traditionally been an alliance based on values. And to, to what extent do you think what we're looking at, looking at is a conflict of values where you have a sovereign country, which, which is, you know, wants to self-determine, has its own process of democracy. And then you have this challenge from essentially an authoritarian state. Um, does that factor into you the way you're viewing the conflict? Well, it factors in at several levels, right? You brought up the question of self-determination. And this is, a, this is also something we saw in the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s, which is uh, the right of self-determination from an imperial center. In one case, Yugoslavia. In the other case, the right of Ukraine from sovereignty from the Soviet Union. Then the question of the rights of people within boundaries to self-determination or not. Uh, this has been, again, part of the Russian Kremlin's justification for this is that uh, the Ukrainian government uh, is not allowing uh, the rights of ethnic Russians to self-cultural and linguistic self-determination, uh, and that this is supposed to provide that, that Russia has a right to protect. Uh, I think one of the things we may go back in the future is uh, when we look back at the era of the early 2000s is did we think through some of the doctrines we proclaimed uh, as we've seen how Russia has used them, both with self-determination, right to protect, other things of that sort? Uh, but again, the question is, is that these are, you know, these are up to people of Ukraine uh, to make these determinations. They do not have a dependent relationship on Russia. They are not uh, part of Russia. Uh, in the sense that Russia has some right or obligation uh, to, to make judgment calls uh, for Ukraine. The question about NATO that you bring in 
again, I also would would caution in that we we've talked a lot in recent decades about NATO as an alliance of values, but really it got its start as a very coldly realist collective security organization uh, to withstand the Soviet threat to Europe. And at the time NATO was created and throughout much of its Cold War history, not all of its members were democracies or they were uh, democracies more in name than in practice. And I'm thinking primarily of some of uh, the Southern members of NATO, Southern European members of NATO during this time. Uh, after the Cold War ended, I think we had this discourse of NATO as an alliance of democracies, but I think now we're having the question again of NATO as defending values or defending members. And this is why the question of Ukraine's membership in NATO has been contentious, not just for Russia, but for existing NATO members who then have to weigh the ethical dilemma, a ethical choice of do we extend protection to Ukraine as a member of NATO on the basis of shared values, and therefore we take onto ourselves the burdens and the risks of potentially fighting a war. Uh, this is why uh, the initial bid to try to bring Ukraine into NATO in 2008 at the Bucharest summit really foundered, because you had a number of states saying, we certainly sympathize with Ukraine, but we're not willing uh, to to make the commitment to treat an attack on Ukraine as an armed attack on us, uh, and therefore to respond, and that has to do again with ethical, with, with some ethical uh, choices, which is who who do you owe your primary ethical duties to? Um, uh, do you owe it to a global community, humanity as a whole, or do you owe it to your specific nation state? And I think we've seen this back. We've seen this, by the way, also with the current, some of the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, which noticeably have exempted the energy trade, because certainly people are willing to impose costs on Russia but there has been hesitation about assuming some of the costs domestically. Uh, and again, uh, there are some who say that's not ethical. Or you should have imposed a full range of sanctions on Russia. But then you also have policymakers who say we have ethical duties to our own populations. And we're trying to uh, balance our obligation to respond to the Russian invasion of Ukraine with what we see as our ethical obligations to our own citizens. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just to get us up to date now, um, I understand that there were uh, representatives meeting in um, at the Belarus-Ukraine border this morning for diplomacy. And um, as a Carnegie organization, you know, we've always sort of privileged or emphasized diplomacy as a means, means to avoid conflict. So uh, sort of a two-part question, Nick. Um, you know, why did diplomacy fail in, you know, why did we end up in a military conflict? And what do you think the prospects are now for some kind of, if not diplomatic settlements, some kind of, uh, you know, cessation of hostilities? Yeah. Look, this is, uh, these are, are really from, from the, from the ethicist perspective, complicated issues, because on the one hand, you could say the ethical Supreme ethical duty is to protect life. And uh, anything uh, that you do to make sure that people don't get killed uh, has to be your guiding light. You have competing ethical duties that say uh, surrendering sovereignty, surrendering self-determination, uh, giving in to demands that are made under the threat of force, uh, that there are ethical questions involved there as well. Uh, and so, again, balancing these compete statesmen, politicians, political leaders, military leaders all have to balance these competing ethical obligations. When the I, I don't have access yet to any sense of how the talks went, uh, but given what has happened in the last 24 hours in terms of the of the fighting in Ukraine, where we've begun to see a shift away from uh, attempts to seize uh centers uh and try to 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 uh, win over local populations to where uh we're, we're now seeing more attacks uh which are much more destructive uh one could for have foreseen a sense of 
uh, a, a Russian delegation saying to the Ukrainians, we, we've, we've held back, but if you don't concede on certain points, we're going to uh, increase the level of destructiveness. And do, does a Ukrainian delegation say to safeguard life uh, and property, uh, we're willing to make diplomatic concessions to end the fighting? Or do we say that, that what you're demanding of us is so injurious to our national sovereignty uh, that we are willing to accept losses in order to defend these principles. And I think what we saw, uh, my understanding is that the talks deadlocked, partly because the Russian and Ukrainian positions are, are very far apart. Uh, Russia is making demands about recognizing the annexation of Crimea, uh, demilitarization of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is asking, had, had asked if I understood the reports correctly, not only for a cessation of hostilities, but that the Russians uh, should evacuate not only the Donbass, but Crimea itself. Uh, under those conditions, there's not going to be a, a, a diplomatic compromise, and, and then the, the, the fighting will, will continue. Um, but yes, that does hit the question. And at what point does diplomacy say that there are compromises Right. Uh, isn't the isn't the old adage that uh, a good diplomatic arrangement is one where no one leaves satisfied? Uh, everyone has had to give something up. Uh, but on the other hand, are there principles at stake uh, for uh, Ukraine that at this point, even taking losses uh, in the battlefield is preferable than, than conceding? Yeah. And that's that that is that that is the ethical tightrope. Uh, that Ukrainians are walking. Russian politicians also are walking ethical type tight ropes. Obviously, sanctions are going to have a real impact on the Russian population. But as we're seeing from some of the uh, protest movements and and concern in Russia, there is an ethical concern uh, that uh, this is a fratricidal conflict. That Russians should not be engaged in combat in Ukraine. Or they should not be killing Ukrainians whether they're Russian-speaking Ukrainians, Ukrainians who view themselves as Russians, or Ukrainians that view Ukraine as a completely separate country and culture from Russia. No matter what, there's some Russians raising the point that that, that's an, you know, that, that is unethical uh, that to, to be doing this, and for what reasons. Uh, and so, again, we'll see how this plays out. The combination of economic sanctions uh, and sanctions being placed on Russia, which are designed to cause pain, for uh, for Russians and and whether or not this uh, ethical argument about uh, the immorality of the conflict, no matter what the patriarch may say about it, uh, certainly uh, a number of Russians do not view this as an ethical uh, action on the part of uh, of the of the Russian state. Nick, I have one um, kind of tactical question about the diplomacy. Um, are there any third parties that have any standing that can help in the mediation? Um, or is this these just direct talks between the parties? Right now, they're direct talks. And the fact yeah. that they were happening, you know, suggests that both sides or were still not closing down the door for for diplomacy. At some point, as this conflict continues, it may take an outside mediator. Uh, we've had two uh, countries that have offered themselves in the run-up to the uh, conflict. We had France uh, offering to, to mediate. We had Turkey offering to mediate. Uh, Azerbaijan has proposed uh, Baku as a neutral meeting place. Uh, now there's talk about whether China which, is, of course, has a close partnership with Russia, but let's also not forget important economic ties to Ukraine, uh, perhaps brokering, uh, brokering talks. But again, really what it's going to come down to is someone's going to have to give for right. diplomacy to work. Uh, that give did not occur prior to the start of fighting, both what the Ukrainians were offering and what the Russians were, were offering or demanding. Um, Putin, for whatever reasons, uh, decided that he would uh, reject diplomacy and choose the use of force. Uh, now the question is, is, are there partners outside of Russia with whom Putin would uh, be responsive to a mediation effort? I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. So um, we have a few questions, um, and you can probably see them in the chat, and I can let you kind of feel them as you wish. I guess you could go from um, sort of top uh, to bottom, 
yeah, from bottom to top in terms of, uh, you know, how we got here in the first place. So I know it's been much debated in the sort of foreign policy analysis community about, you know, you know who bears responsibility, um, the whole question about, you know, NATO enlargement and expansion um, as being provocative. I'm just curious how, how you, you come down on that. Question. Well, let me just put a neutral analyst hat on with the question yeah. of NATO and Russia and say this is what we yeah. describe as the classic security dilemma. Uh, I take steps so that I feel secure and I take those steps and you feel insecure. So you take steps to feel secure and now I feel insecure. I mean, this is the problem of Eastern European history. Uh, Eastern European states surrounded by more powerful states, imperial states, uh, that you know feel insecure unless they themselves have a powerful alliance to join. But once they're part of that alliance, uh, countries that aren't feel insecure, so they take steps. Uh, and could we have headed this off in the 1990s or the 2000s with better statecraft? I think yes, we could have, but you know that that ship sailed uh, in 1997 and in 2004 and in 2008. But again, it's also a reminder, I think, for people that these conflicts don't just happen overnight and that steps that are taken, you know, some people may be saying, well, this is ancient history. Uh, but to say that, yes, decisions that were made in the 1990s are playing themselves out. You have some people describing what's happening in Ukraine today as the last battle of the Cold War, which everyone assumed was over in 1991. Well, maybe, you know, it, it isn't. So in that sense about responsibility, should NATO have not, you know, should Russia have done something differently, is to recognize that this was a security dilemma. And I think at various points, both Western governments and then the Russian government uh, chose to ignore uh, that these dilemmas uh, were real. Uh, but it also brings to another question that's coming through, which is the reality that Russia is a nuclear power. Uh, mm -hmm. Russia is one of the other than, well, even with China's arsenal being smaller, Russia really is the only country that poses an immediate existential threat to the existence of the United States itself. Um, and therefore, that does have to weigh as part of a prudential response uh, that if you're going to, we, again, we've all accepted the ethical obligation that we have to respond, we have to assist Ukraine, but how we assist Ukraine has to be balanced against the ethical and just simply strategic consequences of dealing with a power that has this nuclear capability, which has threatened that under certain circumstances it would be prepared to use it if it felt its own existence was now threatened uh, or in danger. And that has to be a calculation uh, both from an ethical as well as from a strategic point of view. Um, I concur with those who are more cautious on this. I don't think it's ever a good idea to roll the dice uh, on policy actions when nuclear weapons are in play. Uh, for example, you know, direct confrontation of Russia uh, in Ukraine, whether it's military on the ground or aircraft. Uh, just as for Russia, the nuclear threat really is something that they are not going to continue to brandish as responses from the West are less existentially threatening to Russia itself. It becomes harder to make the case that you are willing to use nuclear weapons. Like, for example, to say we're going to use nuclear weapons to respond to sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, it, I think is a bit more of a stretch. But you, the, the risk of a nuclear escalation, if there's a direct military clash, we have to be careful about that. And if that means that we are more cautious than some people are, are calling for. Why aren't we doing more? Uh, the nuclear question is because it is a existential question, not just for countries, but for the planet as a whole. And so there, there does have to be that ethical consideration. Uh, and we know that even a few nuclear detonations uh, would have uh, environmental impacts that would look at the concern about fighting around Chernobyl uh, the Chernobyl exclusion area and increases in radiation that were detected because of the movement of um, tanks and other vehicles through the exclusion zone. 
there was a direct correlation between a, you know tanks coming through and dust in the air, no, not at any kind of lethal levels, not at anything that really poses a threat. But again, that is a reminder uh, of of the care, the prudence. I'm, I'm you know, at Joel, you, as you keep hearing me use the prudence word, you know, harkening right. back to to Morgenthau, right? That always right. has to be the north star of the statesman is prudence, not right. emotionalism, uh, but prudence. And we we do sure. have to be careful. Right. So the challenge here, though, Nick, seems to be, you know, the need for a strong response, right, to show resolve. On the other hand, there is a, a an imperative to uh, avoid escalation. Yeah. Right. And it seems like that's really what needs to be balanced right now. Right. Um, and it's not just on the nuclear side, but it's just sort of incremental. Um, so two things on my mind in terms of the potential for escalation. And one is fairly likely, I would think, which would be as the Russian forces have been bogged down, the temptation to escalate um, and to begin to move away from uh, protection of civilians um, and non-combatants and to move away from you know, the just war principles of, of distinction and uh, discrimination and proportionality, right? And so I would think there's a fairly high likelihood that the Russian uh, military will escalate. Um, are you concerned in that, in that way? Yeah, I think that that is something we, we have to be concerned about uh, precisely because of, as you said, as you get bogged down, the temptation to escalate military force by the way, this is not something that is unique to Russians. We saw this, uh, we see this, you know, in many, in many places o over the last number of years. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, the United States did this in Vietnam with Operation Linebacker when we were felt we were getting bogged down. We thought, well, if we, you know, do massive bombing raids on North Vietnam to, to escalate. Uh, and, you know, some of these encounters that have been filmed of, you know, Ukrainians berating Russian soldiers yelling at them, get out, why are you here? And the relatively restrained reaction uh, of, of Russians. And, you know, I, again, not to, to, to denigrate uh, anyone else, but uh, including, you know, armed forces of our own country. But, you know, we, we've seen where encounters between American forces and civil populations in Iraq and Afghanistan could get out of hand, uh, particularly in the heat of the insurgencies there. Uh, that is the temptation. That is a possibility that, you know, an old lady, uh, a grandmother yelling at Russian troops and, and they sort of sheepishly accepting her, her anger uh, four days ago could become something very different as as this crisis escalates um, and, and how that will play out and how that will also play out back in Russia is going to be very interesting to see. I saw that, you know, the question came in and we always have this perpetual thing about uh, the impact of sanctions and the responsibility of ordinary, the ordinary people suffer the most, but uh, they're being made to suffer for uh, the activities of a government. Uh, and usually the argument is, is that the government doesn't reflect them and it's not what they would want to do. And again, ethically, that also raises some interesting questions, which is, uh, we, we saw this, for example, this was an argument raised against the sanctions against uh, uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia in the 1990s. So, well, the, the regime isn't touched and it's only the ordinary people that suffer. And we saw this with regard to Iraq, sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s. In the case of Russia, I think that we do have to look at a back and forth, which is um, Russia is not, you know, is not a totalitarian dictatorship. It's an authoritarian state. Uh, with some degree of at least, if not popular approbation, where the population has essentially conceded uh, in, in a more apathetic way to let the government do these things. Uh, but they're doing them in the name of the Russian people. Uh, and so the question is the agency of, of Russians in Russia uh, to say, you know, at what point do they have agency to, and we've seen with protests that some are saying that the, not in our name, even if we can't change government policy, we want to show by protesting that, that this is not taking place with our, with, in our name. But it is difficult to, to disaggregate you know, the impact of sanctions 
can we assure that they that they only fall on the head of the guilty and that the innocent are spared? Again, sanction. It's hard to differentiate that. Uh, Joel, we we had talked at, at another point about you know not wanting to to impact you know ordinary Russian students to be able to continue to come and study uh, in the West, in the United States, and Great Britain. Except the the problem is that that sentiment is mixed with the fact that the children of the Russian elite study in the West, and so unless you could sort of say, are you going to have a sanctions that says if your if your family makes more than X amount of money a year, you're you're sanctioned and you can't study in the West. But if you come from a family that is you know not of the business elite, you're allowed in. I mean, I think this is again we grapple with this. We we had this period in time where we had this illusion of what we called smart sanctions, right? That we could just, we could use sanctions. We could just target a small group of guilty people. We could leave the large, we would define as guilty people. We would leave the rest of the country un, uh, untouched. And as we discovered, uh, and as we've discovered from eight years of smart sanctions on different members of the Russian elite, you know, that didn't produce changes in Russia's policy towards Ukraine. So it is a question of, uh, do you inflict? Uh, it's a reverse question to the Russian military deciding to inflict general suffering on the civil population of Ukraine because they're bogged down. And, and the reflection of that is, are these unprecedented sanctions on Russia uh, going to inflict harm on the general population? And again, we're, is this a means to an end that you're trying to end a conflict or, or change uh, or change international behavior? But again, uh, leaders have to walk these ethical tightropes. And I think sometimes we have to give them a little more credit that they're aware that these tightropes tight ropes exist and that they're not always going to get it right. Right. So I know, Nick, you, you've been somewhat um, skeptical of the whole idea of compellence, right? The idea that sanctions can actually compel a country to do something. Um, and is that still your position now? I mean, that so while they may have some utility, it's unrealistic to expect changed behavior. I think on- that I think we have to be very, uh, very cautious in ascribing what sanctions can do. Part of this, again, Joel, this comes back yeah. to another ethical. All of these ethical questions interconnect. But for many years, the, the bargain in the United States has been the American people support American intervention abroad as long as the costs don't fall on them. This is why we've always had this emphasis on no casualties. We don't put boots on the ground. We like drone technology because it seems to uh, give us a way to to deliver a punch uh, without putting uh, American lives at risk. Uh, and sanctions have been, I think, were oversold to Americans as, see, this is a way for us to, quote, do something in the world, but without it really touching you. You're, we're not going to ask you to, to, to really have to sacrifice. And I think we created these unrealistic expectations that imposing sanctions somehow automatically leads to results. In this case, because of the nature of sanctions, because the sanctions are, are really going to have long-term impact on on Russia, it may cause a reevaluation of the cost-benefit analysis of continuing along this path in Ukraine in the longer term. Will it help stop the war in the next 48 to 72 hours? No, it won't. But there is the possibility that they're not the sanctions as they're now being imposed may not compel, but they may cause a reevaluation that mm-hmm. would lead to a different outcome. Mm-hmm. So, um, and back now a little bit to this theme of escalation, because I think it's something that um, everybody is concerned about. So what are the steps that you would suggest that we think about in terms of a principled response to move toward de-escalation in some way? Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, right now, what we're, you know, one of the comments is that, you know, we're actually providing more weapons, right, to the Ukrainians, which is certainly not you know, a de-escalation on the other hand, right? So how do you, how do you sort of weigh those set back do, do you, do you, yeah. uh, do you, do you escalate first in order to create conditions for, right. for a settlement? And I think that, that is, that is a, that, that's a good question, right? I think yeah. the thinking now is strengthening Ukraine's ability to hold off Russian forces creates conditions for diplomacy to work 
uh, down down the road, maybe in, in coming weeks, uh, if Russia looks and says we, we're not going to succeed uh, in what we set out to do and the costs are rising, uh, there's that. So the first issue is, you know, things that will, what is it that will get people to the to the table to talk, uh, to begin negotiations, and is 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 strengthening Ukraine's defensive capacity? Excuse me, capacities part of that, even though it would seem counterintuitive that if you want a war to stop, uh, and again, the German shift on this is pronounced. A week ago, Joel, the 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 German chancellor was echoing that same argument: sending more weapons never helped. Uh, more weapons only makes the situation. Uh, uh, more violent and doesn't lead to resolution. And in a week later, you have Chancellor Schultz in the Bundestag uh, essentially saying uh, mm -hmm. the complete opposite. Ukraine needs more defensive articles precisely in order to get to a settlement. Longer term, we're going to have uh, all the parties, Russia, Ukraine, uh, to the extent that uh, NATO countries uh, and others, China perhaps, all have a stake in how this is resolved. Uh, then we're going to have to go back to questions about pursuing maximalist agendas versus are there compromises that can work if that gets people to a, a stable, a stable settlement. And I think, but I think right now, what we're seeing is is that uh, Ukraine doesn't trust for for good reason, as we've noted at, at, at several times at Carnegie Council uh, in the past about the Budapest Memorandum. They're not going to trust guarantees that don't carry with it automatic penalties, right? The United States and Great Britain uh, made commitments to Ukraine in the Budapest Memorandum that they didn't really weren't prepared to enforce. Uh, and then they got out of it by saying, well, it was just a memorandum. It's not a treaty. It's not binding. Um, Russia, of course, also uh, uh, threw away the Budapest Memorandum uh, on its part. So you might have a Ukraine that says, look, we're not going to feel secure until we're in NATO. Uh, we want that guarantee. And then you may have a Russia that says we will never feel secure with Ukraine and NATO, and therefore we will we will move things forward. Uh, we'll continue. And then the question comes is that is it just simply going to be a battle uh, until one side essentially cries uncle? Either uh, the Ukrainians back away and say we will accept some degree of neutrality and the Russians accept it, or that Russia is so battered by sanctions and by its losses in Ukraine that it loses the ability to veto, uh, to exercise any sort of veto over Ukraine's uh, movement into NATO, which then leads to another long-term question, right? Because one of the things when we discuss ethics and foreign policy is not the, we, we have to look at the ethics of the moment, but we also have to look at the ethics long-term. Right. We, we've talked about in the past these two competing, you know, the ethics to your own citizens and the ethics to you owe to humans as a whole and the ethics of the short term and the ethics of the long term. If the if the end result of this crisis is to move Russia so close to China that it emboldens China to start taking very dangerous steps on the world stage because China will have secured uh, Russia's golden treasury of resources and 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 china essentially now has a is invulnerable to resource disruption does this encourage china to be more um you know uh, aggressive and so then the question of this comes to a i think joel to a question i think people are alluding to which is how do wars end right and if i could just take a take there are four ways in which wars end uh and they all have ethical implications one is uh, I think the one that is most emotionally satisfying to most people, which is, you know, a surrender on the deck of a U.S. battleship in Tokyo Harbor, complete capitulation, uh, the losing side signs away. Um, so that's one way wars end. Um, as we've seen from U.S. efforts in Libya, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, one way is you just simply walk away. <laughs> uh, the conflict may not be over, but you just simply say, we're, we're done, we're finished and you walk away. Um, there is the uh, way in which wars end uh, of uh, what we saw after the Napoleonic Wars, which is where you had an aggressor country in Napoleonic France that was defeated, but was not, the decision was that eliminating it completely as a great power uh, 
uh, was not useful and eliminating it completely from having influence was not going to be useful. So, you know, the reintegration of France into the into the Congress of Europe uh, way uh, in which uh, a war ends. Or you have the last model, which is how the United States uh, and, and, and we've already had this question about honest brokers, the, the Dayton model, uh, where warring parties, uh, whether, and, and again, all the, you know, in, at the Dayton Accords, Bosnia, as the Bosnian state was the invaded party, uh, the Bosnian Serbs, to a lesser extent, the Bosnian Croats were the aggressors and certainly backed by Serbia in the case of the Bosnian Serbs, uh, summoned to Dayton, uh, the United States helped to uh, gain an agreement which no one liked but and which uh, the bosnians as the aggress uh, sorry as the uh, as the invaded were not happy with all the outcomes uh, and yet for all of its flaws uh, we have not had uh, another person die uh, in bosnia as a result of the resumption of fighting and so the, the, there's the dayton model which is you some outside power uh, summons the 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 parties and negotiates some of it and imposes a settlement. How this is going to play out, I don't know. I don't know whether or not the United States would want to try to do a Dayton Accord, whether or not Russia would would accept a Dayton-style accord. The Russians, of course, always want the Napoleonic model. I don't know that they'd necessarily get it. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get the um, end of World War II model. Uh, the real risk is the walking away model. Not necessarily that, 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 that the act of fighting ends and then, as we saw in, in other places, people lose interest uh, and the whole task of post-conflict reconstruction is kind of left uh, on the wayside and then you have sort of perpetual problems that percolate from there uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I see there's a question here from our colleague Tatiana um, about Putin. Yeah. Um, as being the principal decision maker, do you foresee any scenario where he is not the decision maker and there might be some competing uh, center of gravity in Russia that would? Come it's a it's a great question. And again, it comes back to, uh, you know, the, the Napoleonic model. Right. So if Putin is deposed or gets sick or and, and there is some speculation that his health is not robust. Uh, let's say he's replaced, but he's replaced by more of the same, right? He's replaced by the existing Russian establishment. I don't know that with that established, they might try to stop the conflict or broker something, but I doubt that Ukraine would necessarily want to make concessions to them or that the West would make concessions to them. If it's a, you know, a regime change, by what I mean, regime change is not just simply a leader changes, but you actually have uh, a completely different group coming into uh, control of the Russian state. Uh, that might be that might be something different. The problem there is you have Russians, uh, as well as people from across the former Soviet Union that remember a lot of grandiose promises after 1991. Uh, about what the United States and, and Western Europe were going to do to transform uh, the countries of the region, uh, they might say, well, you know, we don't trust those assurances. But that I think part of it is depending on uh, what sort of leadership change you would have in Russia. I can see where you would have one group that would more or less say, well, the Ukraine war didn't work out, but we still have the same designs on Ukraine that Putin did. One group that said the Ukraine thing didn't work out, so we'll pull back and maybe we'll revisit this in a couple of years. And then one group that you know could come in and say, look, we want to fundamentally restructure how Russia is governed and how Russia relates to its its neighbors, starting with Ukraine. That would be, I think, the that last option is the one where I think we in the West would have to think very, uh, very hard about being creative and about putting the resources and attention needed to sustain that transition. Keep in mind, too, that Ukraine, this is essentially Ukraine's third, and now perhaps its fourth, uh, attempt to you know, reorient itself. 1991, 2004, 2014, with the, with the revolution of dignity. Uh, and at each point, you know, Westerners were great with flags and ties, and then they kind of lost interest. The question is, uh, 
Uh, I just saw today President Zelensky is asking the European Union, and I see that there's a question about the European Union as well, is asking, look, we want an expedited pathway to European Union membership. When this is done, you know, we want to know that we, you know, not a vague promise. We want an expedited path. And that will be a real challenge because it's, uh, is the European Union willing to do the heavy work it's going to be needed to, to, to bring Ukraine in? Then tied to that is, could you have an arrangement where Ukraine comes into the European Union, but like other EU members that are not NATO members, it has a different set of security relationships. Um, that potentially could be a way forward. But keep in mind that the Russian reaction to Maidan started not because of NATO, but because of the European Union. Uh, uh, the prospect of, of Ukraine in the European Union was the trigger, not Ukraine joining NATO. Mm -hmm. Great. I just have a couple more questions, and I'm again kind of getting to the principled response. And um, I think it's important in this conversation to talk a little bit about the humanitarian disaster that we're looking at. Um, uh, you may know the figures, Nick, about numbers of refugees that will be leaving Ukraine. Um, what is your sense of uh, the sort of capacity to to deal with the humanitarian crisis? Well, I think that there's a capacity there. And what's interesting yeah. is that, you know, countries in Europe that have, you know, less capacity are the ones that are doing most of the receiving, right? So we've had Moldova, which next to Ukraine is, is one of the poorest countries in Europe, facilitating people coming through Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, uh, you know, Poland making uh, choices to... Um, for example, say, look, we're going to give a number of, you know, benefits. Uh, I, I saw a, a thing on uh, social media of, you know, Ukrainian uh, citizens showing that they're getting, you know, that, yes, the getting free train uh, accommodation to be able to get from the border to uh, either to join relatives or to, to find, uh, find locations. Uh, you know, it is interesting. And again, this also has to do with ethical questions about circles. I do want to bring this up because I think it's important that a Hungary, which a number of years ago was not very keen on refugees coming in from the Middle East, uh, was part of what fueled Viktor Orban's rise uh, in the polls and in Hungary, uh, on the other hand, you know, feels more of a connection to Ukrainians and says we need to help them, right? And so this idea of, you know, the, the ethical circles that reach uh, my sense of duty uh, who do I owe duties to? My own citizens, my own people. Uh, there is a sense, I think, that Ukrainian uh, refugees uh, in Eastern Europe are going to be seen by people as these are our own. Uh, and we want to help them in a way that, you know, we did see some issues in 2015 or 2016 having to deal with refugees coming from the Middle East or, or from Africa. Um, but again, that has to go back to the sense of where do your ethical obligations lie? And I think you're seeing East Europeans willing to uh, help uh, and to make sure that people can get to, to, to safe havens. My understanding is about, about 150,000 people last time I checked. Uh, obviously, more people may, may head out. And if, if the Russians escalate and start using Syria-style tactics in Ukraine, uh, certainly um, you know, people will need to leave just for survival. Uh, it, it would be uh, uh, crazy to tell people to shelter in place if you start having the kinds of strikes that uh, that the Russians and the Iranians and the Syrian government delivered against Aleppo, for example. Uh, and so, yes, that will raise the question. Uh, uh, and again, but we now come back to another issue as well, right, which is that Europeans will have to then accept we have obligations and we have to be willing to make some sacrifices uh, to help both refugees and then the other great question moving forward as this uh, conflict uh, continues is are Europeans willing to pay more of a price in terms of their own personal energy consumption? Because one of the odd things of this conflict is you have two countries that are at war with each other. I know no one goes to war anymore because the UN charter technically outlaws it, so no one declares war, but Russia and Ukraine are at war. Russia has invaded, and yet Russian energy continues to transit Ukraine to European consumers who pay for it through the one unsanctioned, through the unsanctioned uh, payment mechanisms. And then ironically, Russia is still depositing 
transit fees into Ukrainian accounts. I mean, it's it's a real crazy situation there. But the question would be, in, in order to prevent Russia from getting any of that income, would Europeans be prepared to accept, for example, energy rationing uh, in the short term? Um, and so far, the answer is no. And that, again, gives you a sense of the limits of ethical obligation in terms of what people may or may not be willing to bear. To bear. Right. Thanks. That's great. Um, we're coming really towards the end of our of our time. And Nick, I just wanted to maybe you could share with the people that are viewing just what are some of the things you're looking at right now? Um, we talked just before you know we got together here about how you're how you're viewing the news, um, you know, as a consumer of, of this sort of real time information. And maybe you could just share some of your experiences, what you're looking at now and what you're thinking about as things are happening so quickly? Well, I think first and foremost, it's it's easy to be deluged by information and not to necessarily know the provenance of the information or where it's coming from. Uh, social media makes it very easy to forward uh, information that is uh, innocuously inaccurate or deliberately inaccurate. Uh, it's easy for rumors to spread. We saw, for example, that apparently the mayor of Kiev uh, of Kiev had his uh, Instagram cloned and made it seem like he was saying that you know the city is surrounded and we're doomed and uh, and it, and that got a lot of a lot of uh, play. People were tweeting it around uh, and sending it around. And so I think you know we always come back to this and certainly on the doorstep uh, podcast that we do for the council with myself and and, and my co-host uh, Tatiana Serafin, we always encourage people to be informed consumers of news uh, to, to, to verify uh, to, to before just sending something on, particularly if a story really seems to validate your priors or what you'd love it to be true. So I'll just assume that it is to be, to be careful about consuming Know where you're getting your information from. Um, I, I was noting to you earlier before we went live, uh, fascinating uh, work that's being done uh, by people who are, when they get these uh, dash cam videos of things that are happening in Ukraine, of this meticulous verification of, uh, of you know, verifying topographical features, using open source satellite data, looking through social media and news accounts and trying to make sure that if they see something that says, this is something that happened, you know, dramatic footage, that before they post it, they can make sure that it's it's true and it hasn't been, you know, it's not repurposed footage. We, we've certainly, we saw this in every conflict now we see where uh, sometimes news departments that are, are are strapped for cash or want to cut corners say, well, you know, we this is what happened, but we have a nice piece of footage from, from Gaza, which would work here. And so that gets sent out uh, or something from, you know, the Georgia War of 2008 or and it gets posted. And then, you know, what happens is then people this is what can fuel distrust in, in the in the accuracy of media, because when these things come out that, you know, it's not accurate. Then, and this, is, of course, has been part of Russian operations, which is not to necessarily convince you that their line is true, but that you can't trust anything. And so every time, so again, as you're following, for the audience, as you're following this, as you're sharing news, uh, we would, again, just take that extra step before you, you hit retweet uh, to make sure that you're, you're confident or that you've had it verified that this is, is, is a piece of accurate information. That's great. Um, and I know you'll be following some of these issues in the doorstep. Um, and so I would encourage all our viewers to. Uh, uh, our, our plan for this week, uh, for the doorstep uh, this week, is to uh, feature a uh, discussion about the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and that should be live by the, uh, the end of the week. That's great. Well, this might be a good place to conclude. Nick, I want to thank you for joining us thank on you. short notice and thank all the viewers for your great questions on the chat. Um, this will get posted on the Carnegie Council website so people can go back to refer to it. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more conversations to follow. So thanks, Nick. Thank you. Great. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you uh, online at the Carnegie Council website and on social media.
Thanks.